Can you hear me? Is this thing on? Um, so yeah, 27 items to cover in your referral program. Uh, this is actually incredibly uh, product focused, more than the marketing side, so hopefully this is the right room. Um, you can reach me at even.kirigan at gmail.com. If you have any questions about making a referral pl program, please email me. I'd actually really love to help here. Um, and I, I'm on Twitter, uh, have, have varied results there. Um, so I'm going to go through 27 things very, very quickly. And so it's going to be uh, rapid fire. So again, ask me questions in email or after this meeting uh, for, for what you want to hear uh, more about. So first, set expectations. This is not going to be immediately explosive. I mean, people talk about things like viral coefficient and k-factors and other bullshit like that. And it's like, that's not going to happen. Not even come close to that. Uh, so uh, plan on optimizing every single piece of this product. And it's uh, from when people enter the funnel to what they do within it and how it performs. Uh, so really, just get everyone on the same page. This is not like a one-time thing. You have to invest a lot in it. Uh, also, a very, very good first step is to measure happiness. So probably all know what net promoter score is, NPS. And so basically, you take the number of people that really like you, and you subtract the people that really don't like you or wouldn't really tell a friend about it. And so for a referral program, what we're talking about is one person inviting someone else to a platform. So of course, whether or not they would recommend it to a friend matters. And so to estimate the potential impact of a referral program, start with the question, do people like my shit? And if they don't, don't bother. Like, it doesn't make sense. Fix your product first. That's, that's pretty easy logic, but few people do this. Uh, and one, one tool that, uh, there's a bunch of them actually out there, but promoter.io is one that's uh, really easy to use. Um, so the very first practical thing you want to do is to make a track, trackable link. And so these are actual like screen grabbed examples. So you could have like a long code on some endpoint. You can make it so it's actually just a link to your site, but then has UTM parameters or a user code there. The bottom one there is Airbnb, so it just has the person's username. So that must not be tracking that much, at least in the URL. Um, so this is just the mechanics of it. You need like, to be able to track both sides of this. And then for the user that's sending the invites, they actually care a lot about the status here and getting the credit, especially if there's any kind of bonus. So reflect the status. And so that might mean that it's invalid because it's spam or some kind of fraud. It might mean that they opened it or delivered it or uh, it actually followed through. Uh, so these are all really just simple steps involved here. Uh, there's also a symmetric bonus uh, that is really, really common. So this is like the Dropbox thing where like you get extra space if you get, give extra space. And some really interesting aspect of this is why people, uh, why this matters. Because if you're inviting someone to, uh, to a product that they have never heard about and there's some kind of bonus involved, it's like a bonus in a system that they have never heard if it's not some monetary value. It's like, why do they care? Uh, and actually, it's lowering the threshold, the, uh, the activation energy for the sender. So if you're able to make it so that people uh, don't feel like it's spammy because they're giving a gift to another person, then that actually gives them a lot of benefit. So the, the two sides there are really interesting. So the motivation could be for the person, the sender, to get the invite, but then uh, they're actually feeling better about it because the other person gets a side to it. Um, but when you do have a bonus, avoid money. Because if you're talking about something like save $10 or save $5, so if you actually do the math, for example, on how much it costs to have like a half gig in Dropbox, the number of dollars is actually very, very small. And when you start talking about money, you start getting into this market norms space. So if you actually talk about like the benefit is really good. And so Airbnb, for example, talks, I mean, they talk about this in, their, in all, all of their brand and marketing about you know, the experience that you can have with travel. And so giving that gift of a wonderful experience is so much better than saying, hey, save 25 bucks. Like the, the, the money aspect is really to be avoided there. Also, I see this a lot. When you first land on a referral page as a user, like the very first thing you see, besides any kind of prompts to share the link, is like a big fat zero. It's like, hey, you've gotten nothing so far. It's like, what? <laughs> like, don't anchor it on a, such a horrible number. You want it to be like on a, uh, on a potential so you can get like 16 gigs or you can get like so much bonus or this tier on some, some referral program or on like some SaaS tier. Um, and so once they, once they get anything, then you can say, hey, you have this amount and you can go that much deeper into it. Uh, like you can get this much more, uh, but don't anchor it on a zero. So uh, this one is, uh, is kind of obvious, but it's uh, just call out the link. And so people have a really hard time with this, especially normal people. Like, just to be able to say, like, no, what you have to do is take this link right here and give that to someone else. And uh, so you're going to have a piece of flash on your site. And it's different on mobile, of course. But that copy link button is going to be the most annoying thing on your site. It'll be the only bit of flash. And it's going to be a security leak. And it's going to be like all these problems. But you're going to do it anyway, because copy and paste is super awesome. Uh, and so make it really, really easy to share that, that way. Um, and then you have social sharing, which you know, could be right there. 
And the reason I'm starting with these things is because that they're so super easy. They're static. So after you have a tracking link, you can throw up these widgets in there without thinking and customizing anything. You don't have to build a Facebook app in order to share on Facebook. You just have all these sharing tools, like the, the publishing buttons or like buttons or whatever. Uh, and it's super easy to add. Uh, but these are not the best channels. Actually, email is going to be far and away the best. I mean, you have a lot of people that make a lot of noise about how awesome Facebook and Twitter are for distribution, and their paid channels are a little bit different. Um, but email is actually still really, really important. And I think we undervalue this because there's no company that owns email, which is awesome. Uh, so no, no company out there saying, you should really like, go on our platform for marketing. Um, but it's actually really, really, really underappreciated how important email still is. Uh, and then beyond that, you want to do bulk email. And so this is problematic. I think, especially your engineers, like, they're going to think, like, oh, nobody's going to give your, your password to their email account, and nobody's going to auth email. Normal people totally do that. It's just that engineers don't really like it. So you have to have that pushback within your own team. Um, so the thing with this is there is going to be, uh, it's just much, much easier to type in an email address than it is to do like an import auth flow. And again, mobile is different. It's much easier on mobile. Um, but once you start uh, doing this bulk in import, which you'll find a few things. One of them is that the participa participation is going to be lower because it's harder to do because you have to auth a service. But then the number of invites that you can send is going to be that much higher. But the acceptance rate is going to be lower because it tends to be spammier. So if, if on the previous one, I, I, I'm remembering someone's name. Oh, my mom. She would love this thing. I know who that person is. Very close relationship to me. Um, but here, it's like everyone I've ever emailed, and you know, including like an ad at getpocket.com and all these services, whoever I might be emailing that's like nonsensical. So the acceptance rate is much lower. But still do it because it's really valuable. So uh, this is an example from Airbnb. You also have local messaging services. Uh, and so depending on the country you might be in, I mean, WhatsApp is everywhere, but there might be other local ways to, to push this out when you're on a mobile device. Um, and then customize the landing page. And this is something that people really uh, don't do a good enough job here. So this is Airbnb's landing page, and I like it a lot. It's my mug right there, like big fat in the center. And I know it's for me. And one person that's going to be checking out this page is the person that's sending the invitation. And so customizing it to them makes a lot of sense because they know, OK, this is the one for me. I'm going to be able to send this out. So people don't really take that into account enough that the referral links are going to be explored and viewed, and that experience is going to be judged by the person sending the invitation so that they know what they're sending the other person to. Uh, and so this is a no-brainer. I mean, it's, it's just so easy to anchor this on the person, both for, again, the inviter and the invitee. So Airbnb does a good job here, too, on deep linking to the custom mobile landing pages. And we've talked about this a lot already. I've heard some other speakers talk about the attribution problem and basically this disconnect between the experience you have on some mobile landing page, you know, you go from like an email or an SMS or a tweet or whatever, and then you go to the uh, a landing page that maybe sends you straight to the App Store, and then you install from the App Store, and for some god awful reason, the App Store doesn't tell you that the parameters that link to that page. And so you have this app open after they install it, and it's like, who is this person? We don't know. Uh, and so you have tools like, I think Tapstream has one, Yozio is another one, um, and there's a, there's a bunch of them that basically they correlate that experience on the mobile browser before they open up the App Store and then this landing uh, page within the app after you install it. And correlating these is awesome because then you can have that mug right there. You can say, hey, this person that you know invited you. So as far as conversion optimization on mobile, instead of having like a general purpose landing page, you have the friend of the person saying, please sign up. And so it converts so much better. And plus, uh, it actually helps close the loop on that on the referral. So if you have to type in a code, that's really, really awkward in order to, to try to close that loop. So customizing it is also just a practical issue on giving the bonuses where you need to. All right, another bit of customization, and I don't see this enough, and really should. Dropbox, for example, does not do this, so I had to fake this. If I invite an email, make it so that email is there on the landing page ready to go, like ready to sign up. If I invite someone that's one of my Facebook friends, for example, uh, like a direct invite to them if I know the FBID, like, customize the page based upon what you know about that person. Chances are, in that latter case, the, the inviter has off their Facebook account. You already know the name and the face and all these things that you can put on the page for the person registering just to, to customize that. So it's a really easy thing to just make that, that form easier to fill out. Uh, so let's look at what we have here after talking about all these different sources. You have the bulk email import, and number two is that email typing in. Um, but that's actually two sources right there, because if you have imported your contacts, then you have a type ahead there. And I would consider that a different experience. It's a form that has a type ahead and that doesn't. Then you have number three, the link to make a call out. Uh, four is the uh, share on Facebook, and then five on Twitter. So you have to understand the, the tracking 
source here because these channels vary in performance. Some of them have more people using them, others have better results if they do use them, and you ha have to really understand the different sources there. So that starts with, uh, with customizing the link or however you want to do it, the code, in order to say a bit more about like, which channel was used. And you could even go even further and say how this person even came to the referral page. So if you have some kind of drip campaign that says, hey, you should go and send a referral, and that's from email, and it's on this version of that drip campaign because you're actually testing your campaigns, um, then you know not just like the source while they're on the page, but the source from before that. And these kind of analytics really, really help you understand the prioritization of these different features because that copy link button on the bottom, that may be the most important thing. And how are you going to know if it's all the same link everywhere? You're not going to know which one's actually driving the most conversions. So let's look at some stats related to this. So uh, you have the participation rate, which is over all your actives, over all, all your signups, how many people are actually sending referrals? And so that would be like the senders of any channel, and you could also break this down per channel uh, over all your actives. Then you have the spread rate, which would be the recipients per sender. And so if you have the bulk import, that would be where the spread rate goes way up. Uh, but if you have something that's like pu published to Twitter, it's a little bit ambiguous, because you don't really know the number of recipients. It depends on the Twitter user, the number of followers. Uh, and so you might have uh, a different rates there. It's kind of ambiguous. Uh, then you have the click rate, uh, which also varies by source. Uh, again, like bulk email is going to be worse, and publishing to Twitter is going to be pretty good uh, because you have a lot of bots that crawl those links, and so you'll, you'll have a lot of clicks or, unless you fill the, filter them out. Um, and so there's the registration rate, which also varies by source. Um, and then if you do the product of all these things, all the, these four numbers together, what you get, if you just do the math there, uh, is registrations over actives, which is a, a viral coefficient, which is super awesome. Now you can say, okay, this is you know, the number of people that entered uh, th that were active this week, and here's how many people signed up as a result of that. And of course, viral coefficients, I don't like them uh, in, for a number of reasons. One of them is that there's this weird mystique around the number one. Just want to point out something about viral coefficients. If you take a cohort of people, a given like, set of users, and how many people sign up as a result of th those users, over time, that monotonically increases, right? So if you look at like one week for those users, like 10 people signed up, okay, next week 20, 30, it just goes up and up over time. So the whole idea of this number more than one without like a time, that, like, a time bound on that just makes no sense. It's like math-wise makes no sense to even compare. But uh, it's super awesome if you do have some kind of set bounds of time, like if you have a given user cohort, like a certain week of signups, how many people that signed up after that, especially if you break it down per channel. Because you have these really different publishing models, like Twitter, email, bulk email, and you can boil it down to how many people came up from this channel, depending on the usage and all that. And so you can compare apples to apples these different channels of sending these links. So it's really, really convenient. Because maybe one channel is more important than you think. We actually did find out that like, calling out the, that link was more important than we thought it was uh, in some of our testing. Um, testing custom messages. This is Wealthfront's invite flow. And so they put words in my mouth here. They, they said, hey, this is the email I want you to send. Go send it. I find this a little bit weird because it's usually obvious. Like when I'm reading an email that's coming, written by a marketer at the company that hosted that form, like I usually can tell. Uh, and so an optional way to do that is to say, here's the email that we're going to send, and here's a little message to add in. So for example, the Dropbox shared folder invitations work that way to add some context around like, the files. Like that's the name of the folder. So you have to add some context around what you're sharing. So it makes more sense there. And so you could test adding these in. And the good news is that, I mean, that'll, that'll help probably in the conversion rate to have more words from the, from the inviter, but it also is a harder thing to do, so you're going to have lower participation rate. And this is why the metrics are so important, because you have lower participation but higher acceptance rate, so what do you do? Test it. And you have to know that breakdown. So the positioning of the marketing uh, of this effort, like the, uh, when you talk about your referral program, how are you talking about it? And so there's a bunch of different ways of saying it. It's like give a widget, get a widget. That's like Uber does that. Uh, get an extra widget for free. Uh, give the gift of widgets. Airbnb is go anywhere, stay for less. And that's probably, I was just in some A-B test. I'm sure they're testing a bunch of things. Um, refer your friends. Get uh, X dollars off your next widget. Get credit. These are all different things. And depending on your audience, they might care about different matters there. Uh, and they're all kind of different, really, uh, depending on the value. So if I'm talking about some marketing automation tool, like give the gift of better marketing automation. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but if, like, you know, if you're talking about like, travel, it does start to make sense. Uh, so you, know, you, you can, you can kind of position it based upon the actual product and the audience receiving it. This is just basic marketing. So uh, this one's really, really, really important because so many referral systems are tacked on. I mean, they're literally products that are tacked on referral systems that I would recommend using if you don't have the engineering resources. Uh, though you just tack them on, and then there's no point in the product at which you need to use it. And so to compare, for example, sending a referral 
which is like kind of an artificial thing to do versus a shared folder invitation in Dropbox, it's so much more natural because sharing is part of the platform. Uh, and so in Dropbox, is, it is an awesome place to do it. It's when you run out of space. And so if you're about to run out of space, they say, hey, you should subscribe or you know, get some friends in there. And so this is uh, the relationship between uh, referrals as an alternative to the premium tier on your freemium platform is really, really nice. Um, and not enough people do this. So, I mean, for example, if you're an e-commerce platform and you have a checkout page, get an immediate discount uh, right there by like sending an invite or prompting them or on the thank you page or afterwards. Or, I mean, there's so many places this needs to be done. I just really have to uh, like tell Uber and Lyft, like make the in-ride experience about sending invites. Like you have a captive audience there. So tell the driver to tell the person to get this ride for free. I'm shocked they don't do that yet. Uh, and they will now that I've said that. Uh, so. Um, so yeah, incorporating the product flow is just really, really, really important because you have no other time to do it. Uh, and this really highlights that the, 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 the top of the funnel really matters a lot. So okay, suggested invites. So let's say you have Facebook or on mobile, you have a mobile address book, uh, and you have like a bunch of contacts there. Uh, this is an example in Dropbox, and it's kind of hard to see. They've actually called out like people with my same last name at the top. They're doing a pretty poor job because all those users, I mean, I used to work at Dropbox, so of course everyone in my family, like, of course, they made them get accounts. Uh, so they just happen to have email, old email addresses that don't correspond to the email addresses that they have used already. And so they're doing a very poor job of filtering. So overall, I think this is a huge, huge opportunity to drive more engagement here. And this is not just for referral flows, but any kind of sharing and invite link. I think this so much, in fact, that I'm working on this. So if you want to have a social graph analysis like as, as part of your product, you should email me. Because uh, especially for referral flows, this is something we're going to build as a service. Uh, and I think it's going to be awesome. Um, but for what you could do, like a, a poor man's version of this is like same last names. That sounds good. Uh, maybe a same company work email address, something like that. Um, so you can, you can vary it depending on how it goes. And you could also do like a bit of analysis to find like number of mutual contacts or all these things or live in the same city or the same phone array code. And that's the whole point. You can look at a million of these factors, but we're going to do a better job than you can hope to do. Uh, so you should use us. <laughs> so uh, again, top of the funnel is really important. Um, and so I have only a few minutes left, but I think I'm good on time. Uh, so here we did this test where we uh, just changed the prompt on uh, when we talk about using the referral program. So the actual email here, if you read it, is saying something unrelated to referrals. It's saying, hey, this person joined your shared folder, right? P.S. Get extra space for free. And we ran this test on a bunch of different emails, uh, and the results were really good. But then when we launched it across a bunch of emails, all the same message, uh, the results were even better. And so I think these kinds of constant prompts to send people uh, just gets people in the top of the funnel. Because you can work a lot on like when you're on the referral page, how many invites get sent, and the performance there, and the copy of retweets, and all these things you can work on. But just getting people to that page becomes an issue. And so the, the math is such that the top of the funnel is going to be really important. Um, and also, I was mentioning setting expectations. Expect a, a small number of people to even use your referral program. So the math people might do is like, OK, I have you know, 1,000 signups, and then 50% become active. And so if they each invite, on average, one person, then I'll, like, I'll have a lot of signups from that. That's not how it works. You have 1,000 signups, 50% become active, 2% use a referral program, or even visit that page, and 1% even send any invites, and your acceptance rate is 50%. If that's probably more like 10%, and so all of a sudden you have like half of an invite off of those 1,000. So that, that's, like, that's the math. That's how it works out. Uh, so top of the funnel is important. Uh, another thing that I've, I've seen with Wellfront, but not other people do, and I think is a huge opportunity, is reminders of uh, the invitation status. So if I've sent out invites and they've been accepted, that's cool. They can tell me that, and it's a reminder. I actually cut off some others below that uh, in, this, in this screenshot that haven't accepted yet. And so there's a prompt to remind them if you can build that feature. There's just some basic status of like knowing whether the person has clicked the link or landed on the page, is registered, but in Wealthfront's case, hasn't funded the account to close the loop there. Uh, and so structurally, this changes the invitation prompts. So how often are you going to prompt someone to send referrals? Like max once a week? That's a really tough sell, right? Like how many creative ways can you say, do this shit, like the same exact task, please go to this page. But how often can you remind someone that, of the status? It's a transaction email all of a sudden. It's like, hey, this is this thing you did. We're just, we're just telling you this activity that you took. Uh, and so they send this email weekly. Awesome. Like <laughs> a weekly prompt to send more referrals. That's not quite what it's saying, but that's basically what it, the intention is. This is another really cool one. I don't see it enough. So Dropbox, if you create a shared folder, invite someone to it, and then they sign up, um, it's actually a support issue. You actually get referral credit for that invitee, or the person that invited them first. 
And the issue there is that if, you, if they didn't do that, then somebody would complain that oh, somebody I invited did not give me the referral credit. But there's another awesome fact here. Like, you have an excuse to tell the user about the referral program. <laughs> like, again, are you seeing a theme here? So if you uh, use a different sharing channel besides referrals and you trigger a sign up, that's a perfect excuse to send uh, to that original inviter, hey, you got this bonus. And this is why, if you want more, send more invites. So in this case, you have an entirely different channel. And so imagine, for example, everyone that posted anything to like Pinterest or Twitter or Facebook, if you actually did the right tracking to be able to know where those users came from, every single one of those people you can then prompt once you, once you attribute the signups, um, which takes a bit of work because those links oftentimes don't have like the inviter status on them. So uh, second to last, expect fraud. Uh, and this is a major bummer. Uh, so you think, oh, I have, uh, I have a closed system. We just have some bonus in our... our our, uh, you know, on our SaaS or whatever. It's not, where's the fraud? I, I don't get it. You can't get any cash out of it. Uh, and then you'll find people saying, like, post on Craigslist or ads on, on Google or whatever, like, hey, uh, do you want more, more of this on this system? Like, pay me and I'll get you more of this. And so if there's any kind of service to fraud, defraud your platform, all of a sudden you've created liquidity. It's like this implicit way of backdoor cashing out the benefit that you have. So I can pretty much guarantee this is going to happen. And it's really bad. The creative things that some folks did with Dropbox uh, were just incredible. I mean, there's just a lot of anti-fraud Dropbox already does because of the desktop client. You have to install it. But then people would make like EC2 instances full of these VMs to have like unique IDs on the machines to be able to sign up. And then the people that do this kind of thing, they know how to use the extra space as like a free S3. So it's a total mess. Uh, so uh, expect it. Uh, but don't do anything about it at the start if you're just building this yourself. I would recommend starting out with just the basic things, like filtering out like, the number of uh, like evan.kiergan at gmail.com versus evan.kiergan plus one at gmail.com. Like, filter that out. That's easy. Um, or like company emails or however you do it or own domains. Um, all right. Testing flows. So what I mean specifically here is that uh, you know, I, I showed you like, these static landing pages. You might want to instead have like, one and then another and then another step. And this is sort of like uh, equivalent to like testing drip email campaigns. You have different configurations of going through those funnels. Uh, and this is kind of hard to test, but it's worthwhile. Because if one channel, like an email flow, is that much more important, then you might want to make that front and center and take away everything else. Um, but that might come at the cost of those other channels. And so this is something worth testing, at least, to be able to see like, what the best channel is. Maybe it's that you don't expose those at first, but the second time they come to the page, you do it. Maybe it's something you even incorporate into your marketing around it. Like, Congrats on sending the email. Now go post on Twitter. And it's like this drip campaign just on anyone that's ever used your referral program where you could just say every other channel they haven't used. So again, excuses to talk about that. And that's number 27, but a bonus one. Oh, 28 reasons, 28 things to do. Track what other people are doing. This, is, this should be obvious from this talk, right? Like I've looked at Wealthfront, Airbnb, Dropbox, Instacart, uh, like Spoon Rocket, like all these. I look at them all the time. Uh, to look at what they're doing and to see like, what, the, what the tactics are, what the preferences are. Uh, and so what this enables you to do is to say, like, oh, they're, they have this preference, this bias towards uh, like, uh, social sharing versus email. Or they're doing this interesting thing with like, suggested invites, or this strategy on uh, suggested invites. And so uh, you, know, you, can, you can track them and, and get better that way. Um, and so I've done this a lot. So if you have any questions, do email me, even like here again at gmail.com. And I think we might have like, one question or two time for it. Yeah, this is a general issue. Do you get people to be social when they haven't engaged with your site very deeply? I think the short answer is no, because what are they sharing? Nobody knows, right? Uh, the, the complex issue is in social products that the experience changes depending on other people being there. So if I have some collaboration like photo album thing, if the experience is invite people to do it, uh, to help like, collaborate, then you have to do the invites. But explaining what they're inviting to is a bit complicated because these are new users. Um, I also don't like pop-ups, but yeah, there's that too. Um, maybe one more question. So a great one is just with different tiers. And people should totally experiment with this. I don't see this nearly enough. It's like, hey, do you want a week on the premium tier without putting your credit card in? Like, send a referral. Or like, uh, you start off on the premium tier and you can like go down or, or whatever have you. So you, you might have like a lot of cash there, but then you can experience it the, uh, with, uh, with that. I mean, B2B also typically has like, you know, a typical pricing page. You have like a bunch of items. Like one of those items you can get from referrals. And so uh, what's a good example? Maybe like t dino time on 
Heroku. <laughs> like, like, you know, just like miscellaneous B2B, like totally obscure thing, but I would totally, for like free dino hours, I would totally gladly do it. And again, it's not about cash. Um, and uh, while, I, while I'm talking about B2B and invites, uh, if you're working on a B2B app, please think about the collaborative experience. Like, make the user of your app look smart to their boss and make it easy to invite and send reports to their boss. It's a huge mistake when it comes to the social aspect of B2B software. They all think it's these companies they don't want to share. They totally want to share, internal to the company. It's really important, but that's an addendum to that comment. All right.